of my number one biggest piece of advice that I cannot stress enough. If you want to go into the games industry, you make games. For some students, it's like, well, we don't have any games courses. That's fine. You make games. You go make games. You know, students who really want to get into this industry have to be able to get over that inertia to get themselves in a mindset where they are developing games. They might be developing crappy games. That's okay. They're developing games. And a lot of students, you know, I would say of all of the students that have asked me to get into the video game industry, like some you know, advice for that, that path, probably close to 60% of all computer science students I have taught have asked me that question. Of that 60%, maybe 10% of them, I, on a good day I might say 20%, will have actually made any attempt at making a game. I'd say of that 10 to 20%, maybe 5% of those have actually gone through the steps of completing a game. So that includes like doing all the user interface, all of those ugly bits that you have to contend with when you set upon doing something as challenging as, as that. And of that, maybe another 5% have actually published anything. So now we're getting down to very, very, very small percentage of folks who have actually gone through and, and done this entire thing. And yet that's what they need. Making games is extremely difficult. It's difficult for a multitude of reasons. One is that it is a fundamentally interdisciplinary task. Whether or not you yourself are taking it upon yourself to, to see yourself through those interdisciplinary tasks, i.e. doing the art, doing the UI, doing the game design, doing all of these different pieces. I mean, that's, that's a possible route. And for many people, for their first games, that is exactly the route that they take. And that's, that's great. That's fine. But uh, for others, it involves working with other people with those, those skill sets. And I think that that is one of the big holes that exists in a lot of the traditional computer science programs right now. It's not universal by all means, and I know a lot of great people are making strides in this area. That ability to work interdisciplinarily, to know how to talk to an artist, for example, to know what that asset pipeline, pipeline even looks like. I mean, that's stuff that our, typically our students graduate without any knowledge. And so when they go into the industry and someone's looking at their resume, and they're like, well, what experience do you have? And they're like, well, you know, I, I programmed an air traffic control simulator for my projects course. It's like, well, OK. <laughs> you and all the rest of the, the class did that. You, you don't have any creative expression in a lot of this. You don't have any experience working with, with graphical assets. And I'm not talking about doing all of the ugly Java GUI stuff that we often teach. I'm talking about like what is, what is real user interface? What, is, um, what are the actual tools that are available out there? There's a lot of, of UI tools, for example, that are used. You, you don't, you, rarely in the games industry would you hard code the, the UI from scratch. You'd use a bunch of other tools. Maybe you're developing in Unity. With Unity, there's things like NGUI. The new Unity 5 is going to have a whole suite of, of uh, tools for that kind of thing. So there's all of these other things, and our students don't have any exposure to these. And they haven't necessarily worked with artists, so like I said, they don't know those pipelines and all of those. So those are all really, really, really big things. And on top of that, they haven't gone through the full development process. So they haven't set out to to uncover as they go along exactly why it is so hard to make a game. So they don't know about, you know, they figure, well, it's just like another programming project, right? I mean, how hard can it be? It's just, it's interactive. That's the difference. But making something interactive and understanding what it means to engage people, to be able to truly iterate, to actually do rapid prototyping. You know, a lot of students, I think, have absolutely no idea what rapid prototyping is coming out of their degree. And, and it's hard to blame them because it's hard for us as the, as the instructors to set up experiences that really support true rapid prototyping. I mean, the program where I teach now, the master's program, it, it's, it's great in that we only have you know, 40 or 50 students for, for our faculty, so we can work really closely with the students. And you know, I'll be supervising a team of six students, and that will be my team for the semester. So it, it, it really frees me up to be able to push them for rapid prototyping and doing all of these things. But when I'm staring at 150 faces in a computer science class, I mean, how could I reasonably facilitate a rapid prototyping environment? I can't really. And so we see the same thing. It collapses into everybody doing the same project across the board. And you know, it's a, it's a utilitarian thing as much as anything, but it does leave some, some pretty big holes. So students can do, kind of bring it around full circle, I think students can do a few different things. 
personal projects. Students need to really embrace the personal project. I know, I mean, I've been there, I've done it, I know school is a lot of hard work, I know there's a lot of things to do, but spending some time, even if you just dedicate a few hours a week to work on your own personal project will go a huge way. Learn how to do a proper portfolio. A portfolio is not a canonical list of I did this, I did this, I did this. It's a list of I did this, and here's the challenges that I faced here. That's how I solved these challenges. Here's the algorithm that I came up with, or here's the software package that I learned and then had to apply. Here are the other people that I had to work with in order to solve this problem. That's far more interesting to a potential employer than, you know, yeah, I did the airport traffic controller. Yeah, I did, you know, the projects that everybody else did. I mean, those, those aren't meaningful. Students need to recognize how to cast things such that an employer looking at their, their resume can look at that and see, yes, I can make use of that. Like, that's relevant to me, that's relevant to my team, as opposed to something that looks like, like everybody else. So doing those projects, uh, game jams. There's so many game jams happening. You know, I ran Global Game Jam for, for many years. Uh, it's an opportunity for, for people to come together on a weekend, so it's like a nice bite sizey kind of uh, opportunity to go through something that is the closest you're going to get to a real-world game development cycle that isn't in the real world in some loose sense. I mean, it is the real world, but you know, it gives you an opportunity to work with strangers that you've never met, um, people from the industry who maybe be, might be industry veterans, to work with artists, to work with, you know, all sorts of different people. And you set, all share, you all come together into this shared challenge of let's make a game this weekend. A lot of employers these days are looking at whether or not students have been doing game jams. A lot of my students that get interviewed get ex asked exactly that. Well, how many game jams have you done? If you're saying zero today, that's a real problem because there's so many available out there. Saying zero five years ago, well, nobody knew what a game jam was hardly five years ago. That's different. But there are so many opportunities out there. And then finally, look where you live. Look at your community and get involved with, with local meetup groups if they exist. If you're in Vancouver, for example, uh, or there's other large communities like Boston and San Francisco and Toronto, we all boast very large independent game developer meetup groups. Here in Vancouver, I run Full Indie, which is our local group. We have 2,000 people that are a part of this who are all independent game developers. They make their living doing that. And a lot of, uh, a lot of great things come out of this group. If you show up as somebody who's working your way on a game and you need some help, these are awesome, open, wonderful communities. So you can connect with these people, you can get amazing advice, you can share in the expertise that has been hard, hard wrought from these folks who've been making it in this industry for some time. So they're great learning experiences, they're great doses of perspective for somebody aspiring toward that, uh, to that industry. And my final point would just be to say that the industry itself is shifting quite dramatically and while there are still big AAA companies out there, the model is shifting toward more of an independent game developer, partly because of the high saturation of the market and the difficulty out there in being able to recoup the costs of a high production value game. So students need to be aware of these kind of industry trends. Going out to these meetups and stuff will, will help them keep apprised of that, but also it helps them understand that they better have a high degree of initiative if they're going to survive in this industry and, and they better take some steps to figure out what it's really about.